Okay, this is chapter one for the American government course. Be sure to read the chapter one in the textbook, provide supplemental information to the video lectures. For the most part, the test material will come from the video lectures unless otherwise noted. So let's ask ourselves, why is government necessary? The very crucial period of the state formation occurred after the decline of feudalism in the 14th through the 16th centuries. And there was numerous advantages to having a territorial, a territorially defined authority that people would come together with borders and government that they would put some sort of trust into. So there was a trade-off that was necessary as well at that time with uh, trying to create a peaceful society. So one of the first orders of government is to maintain order. And Thomas Hobbes, very prominent philosopher, was writing about that same time when the modern state started to form. And he was a very foresightful political, moral philosopher at that time, well ahead of his time. And he started to realize that in order, humans are naturally self-interested, self competitive creatures. And in order to, to allow some protection that the state would provide, human beings would have to sacrifice a little bit of freedom in order to have the safety that this collective common power could provide. And he wrote famously that unless we do that, life is going to be nasty, brutish, and short. So the modern state and this concept of government has provided numerous advantages to human beings over the past several centuries. And one of the other necessary functions of government, particularly since we're focusing on American government, which is a democratic form of government, and that's to protect individual liberties, individual rights, and property rights. That is somewhat at the foundation of this concept of liberalism that we're going to talk about in a few minutes that was formulated by John Locke around that time in the late 1600s. And you could certainly argue, as we will talk more later on when we get into how the Constitution was formed and what the main motivations behind the Constitution were, you can see that this concept of liberalism that we're going to talk about is kind of at the core of the U.S. system. And here, keep in mind, we're not talking about liberal as in the form of a liberal political party versus a conservative political party. We're talking about a concept that all American democratic parties evolved out of. Another thing that government does is to provide public goods. These are goods that uh, are typically unable to be provided by the market. If they are, they have to worry about free riders, and it uh, may be more effective for society to have government provide these through collective decision making. This includes our military defense, for example, education, libraries, police forces, fire departments, and things like that. So just a little bit more about public goods. These are typically non-rival in consumption, and that basically means that if I use it, it's not going to take away your use of it. Now, keep in mind that on a crowded public highway, my use of it and everybody else's use of it, might it might get crowded and it might deter people from using it. So in that sense, highways would not be considered a pure public good. They are a type of public good. So there's lots of different types of public goods. But uh, the pure public good is non-rival in consumption. My use of the military defense, the national defense, doesn't deprive your protection of the uh, military defense. And that they're also non-excludable, which means once they're provided, we can't exclude anybody from using them. Now, they're public goods primarily because they have characteristics that are 
making it difficult for the private sector to produce them for a profit. We might brainstorm a little bit more about public goods as to why certain things are not provided by the government, why certain things are. But another criteria of a public good is that since people cannot be excluded from benefits, we would have free riders that could be unwilling to pay for them. And that's one of the things that also delineates a private good is because a private good would be able to prevent free riding of the consumption of that product. But uh, that's another thing that we've got to deal with that uh, these public goods have to be paid for and we could have potentially a lot of free riders using them up. As far as what politics is, there's lots of definitions that we could use here and you can read those. It's, it's the, the art of compromise, you could say, in trying to make decisions for the entire group through the use of power to have a share or a say in government. Political science kind of phrased it this way. Politics is who gets what, when and how. There's obviously lots of uh, negative connotations of politics out there. Well, one of my favorite negative definitions is that politics is, is the word poly, meaning many, and ticks, meaning bloodsuckers. It's a lot of cynical definitions out there. And you could perhaps argue that we're getting away from the original intent of politics in our current system, why politics is more polarized and divisive, perhaps, than it used to be when politics was considered more of an art of coming together and giving and taking and trying to come up with some, even if they're just incremental, solutions to a problem. But we also uh, will be stressing throughout this course is that politics is at the heart of a society because that's where the decisions are made. First of all, we have to decide to come together and create a society, a, a system with a political organization that's going to uh, hopefully keep things safe and organized. Economic institutions are, of course, critical for determining whether a country is poor or prosperous, but it's politics and it's political institutions that determine what the economic institutions a country has. So the political organization decides that, sets that up, establishes the framework and the rules behind it. We're going to be talking a lot more about that. A central theme is that government politics is at the core of the society. And then, of course, the social forces are interacting with that. Now, there's, of course, lots of room for criticism and most definitely you know, satirical political cartooning with our government. Here's one that is kind of pointing out the fact that we've got lots of infrastructure that is the, uh, our roads and bridges and our water systems and electric grids and all that, that uh, are classic public goods in our society. And much of that is aging and getting almost to the point where it's uh, in major need of repair or upgrading in many cases. And we may be losing the collective ability to solve these problems, particularly if, if we become more averse to paying taxes in order to uh, to solve some of these issues, that sort of thing. So let's talk about liberalism, which is a kind of a philosophical concept that was forming for uh, quite a while, but it was kind of put together by John Locke, as I said before, and this is the, the principle upon which our U.S. democracy is based, as well as the liberal versus conservative ideologies. So Locke was a close friend of Isaac Newton, who had come up with all the laws of motion and physics and calculus and things like that. And Locke and other moral philosophers around that time, uh, Thomas Hobbes even before that. But Locke was starting to think about could certain rules be applied to human behavior, much like laws of motion would apply to uh, objects. 
And so he started to put together these basic concepts that would kind of work for an organized society. And of course, he, he also had the uh, example of England to look at that had been also kind of evolving at that time because it's worth noting that John Locke was writing at the same time that the Glorious Revolution occurred, which was 1688, when the Parliament essentially took over from the monarchy. That was a pretty major transition right there. So Locke was, was talking about what kind of principles would work for a system that was run by the people rather than just one individual king or queen. We've already talked about individual rights, freedoms, liber civil liberties, property rights. Those are at the heart of this liberal system. Now, the rule of law, most importantly, in that you've got a law that's the foundation. We'll talk about the Constitution as our bedrock in the next couple of chapters. That you have the respect for the rule of law, and that's something that a lot of societies don't have. They have, uh, have had a very unstable or even a corrupt society for a long time, and so there's not as much respect for the rule of law. But as you evolve into a stable society with a relatively healthy political organization, then you establish these norms of the rule of law, which means that regardless of who we elect as the next president, the basic rule of law is there. It doesn't change just because we elect a new person. In our case, the U.S. Constitution and the statutes that are created by our legislators. But along with that, we have to have this healthy respect for the rule of law as well. Now, trusteeship, that's another way of talking about voting. What we're doing is giving power to the government as long as it does what it's supposed to do as well as the right to remove them. Now, Locke does talk about rebellion, but in the modern terms, it's more the, the right to, to elect somebody else, get rid of them if they're not doing what we want them to do. So a lot of times in, in the, the news where societies in other, well, other countries are shifting and trying to form democratic systems, and you hear that well, they just had their first elections, and the, a lot of publicity will go into the, to the idea that now they've got their democracy. Well, elections is just one part of it. Elections is the start, but it really takes a long time to evolve into a democratic culture. Another thing that's a foundation of liberalism is a limited government so that it does not you know, become overbearing, come start taking control of people because government results from the people, so it's, it stays somewhat limited. So those are the basic concepts of liberalism. Now, for the rest of this uh, chapter here, I want to talk a, a little bit about the political divide in the United States and kind of get that out of the way because the, the class is not really going to be a forum, forum for debating or arguing as to uh, which side is this or that. We're going to look at this analytically as far as, you know, how things occurred, why they occur, the whys, the what fors. The conservative side of politics, and this is a little bit uh, simplified in the American system because we have generally a two-party system, which we'll talk about that in more detail later on. But our two-party system is pretty predominant here, and one of them is the conservative or the Republican party side that uh, typically holds on to traditional values such as family values, even religious values are probably a little bit more influential on the conservative side. You know, the old social values, uh, a little bit more resistant to change of uh, family values and things like that. The uh, conservative party typically is advocating for less government intervention, particularly with the market free market principles. Now, of course, what we have to keep in mind is that any party is going to want to intervene on things that they find it very important to, uh, to their philosophy. So we have to keep in mind that these are very broad generalities here as to 
the political divide. The liberal side, sometimes referred to as the progressive side of the political divide there, the Democratic Party side. Generally, we're looking at uh, more acceptance of shifting norms, of changing norms. Uh, ship, you know, the family has changed quite a bit over the past few decades as far as more divorce, more alternative lifestyles, things like that. The liberal side is a little bit more proactive on trying to make things a little bit more equal, even though that's virtually an impossibility in uh, in human nature to make things totally equal. But uh, we'll, as we'll get into, there's some issues. You know, inequality may be getting to the point where it's becoming somewhat dysfunctional. So uh, we've got both sides looking at that might even find some common ground on some things of that nature. The development of the political divide, is, of course, would be covered in considerably more detail in another class. But uh, just going back, the conservative viewpoint perhaps has got its roots in Edmund Burke, who was a uh, member of parliament in England, and he was a very well-respected philosopher and writer as well, and he wrote extensively on the French Revolution and had a relatively negative view of the French Revolution uh, in that they were upending traditional norms of authority. And, and Burke was saying that it's uh, you can't just overthrow these things on a whim, that you have to have some maintenance of traditional authority, that sort of thing goes all the way back to that. But as we get into the 1800s, we also see that America really starts to become a very, very strong Christian nation, particularly Protestant Christian nation, even though the, as we'll see, the people that founded our country and wrote the Constitution were agreeable to the idea of separating church and state an American norm, these Christian values. We'll talk a little bit more about John Stuart Mill here in the next slide. He was the first really prominent progressive thinker. He was very open to things such as universal education, women's voting, things like that. Utilitarian concepts of trying to spread as much benefit as you could to more people. So the, the traditional... Christian values started to kind of push back against that. So there, there started to be somewhat of a divergence there or the preference towards our traditional Christian values, a little bit more opposition to these progressive values that were starting to come about, and opposition to socialism, which really started to become a major idea that countries were willing to embrace, particularly in the late 1800s, the American ideals of freedom, individuality, and capitalism were very much opposed to anything socialist. Republican or the conservative side started to shift very much towards support of the business, the corporate class there. And then as we get into the 1930s, the Depression was really devastating to American society, and when Franklin Roosevelt was elected, he enacted several proposals that were trying to you know, alleviate the damage from the Depression, but it also called for more government intervention in order to do that, so therefore the more traditional Republican conservative thinkers were still saying, well, yes, we got problems to solve, but we don't want more government intervention kind of solidified the division there, and you could argue that it probably has uh, divided even more dramatically since the 1980s. As far as the liberal side, we, we've already talked about John Stuart Mill. As we get into the 1800s, he is very influential in his writings on representative democracy, trying to promote education for all universal suffrage where everyone gets to vote, even though he did have some interesting ideas on earning the right to vote through education, but also supported women's rights 
which America was certainly not ready for that in the 1800s. And then the, the liberal or the progressive side started to feel a little bit more sympathy for the working class as we get into the Industrial Revolution. We started to see inequality growing dramatically. The working class was not getting the share of the benefits from the Industrial Revolution that the, uh, the owner class was. Of course, this also inspired Karl Marx's writings as well. But the, the Democratic Party side started to embrace the working class, the minorities, in order to try to alleviate some of the inequality and the hardships that they were dealing with. The term progressive, because we really saw a progressive era there at the end of the 1800s into the early 1900s, somewhat as of a reaction to the inequality and you know, it was quite a bit of corruption that was uh, that came about as well throughout the Industrial Revolution. We'll we'll talk about some of those things in a little bit more detail later on. Here, I just want to give you a general overview. But as we get into the 1920s, that progressive term starts to shift to liberal and stays stuck as a label for the the Democratic Party side. And I've already talked about how the Depression was uh, very instrumental in increasing government intervention because of the just total collapse of the economy. Roosevelt's New Deal policies, and we'll get into what some of those were later on, kind of set the tone for government involvement in, in trying to alleviate particularly economic problems, but it also did increase that divide between the liberal side and the conservative side that still did not want government to get more involved. So this two-party system that we have for a, a few reasons that we'll get into, the, there's a couple of things in the, Constitution, in the Constitution that have really facilitated this two-party system, but we've also been socialized into it for a long time, so it's kind of what we're used to, and it'd be very difficult to change this either-or thinking. It's kind of easier for us. We kind of like to categorize things in this or that, up or down, right or left, good or bad. If we feel like there's any reform needed, it would be very difficult to reform because of some structural elements that are very conducive to that. Now, our increasing po polarization, that political divide always warrants a lot of criticism. You know, we'll, we'll talk more about the Supreme Court and because of our polarization, our legislature really is not as productive as it used to be. So therefore it defers a lot of decisions to the court. The court actually resolved the issue of same-sex marriage. We also see that the court struck down part of the Voting Rights Act enacted back in the 1960s when there was a massive discrimination, particularly in the South, against minorities even registering to vote. And one of my favorites here is that we may be invading our own privacy pretty much since we're putting so much of our lives on social media and on our devices, but we also are in an area, an era that will be for a long time that fighting terrorism. Even domestic terrorism seems to be almost as big of an issue as foreign terrorism now, but agencies just such as the NSA are trying to prevent terrorism through surveillance. Oh, there's a trade-off. At, at what point is there too much surveillance where we're invading our privacy, but yet we still want them to prevent terrorist attacks? This one's from the Obama era, but it's still relevant is how confusing it is out there in the foreign relations area because uh we may ally with one country in order to fight something, and then they're, they, they could actually be against us on something else. So if we, in Syria, for example, we, we were generally supportive of the pro-democracy rebels, but then it turned into more of a sectarian war where some of those pro-democracy rebels that we may have been assisting were aligning with terrorist groups from other regions, and so that made it very problematic. Here's a swipe at the, the fact that women are paid less than men. Uh, we'll maybe talk about this a little bit later. 
particularly the efforts to put a woman on the $20 bill, which seems to have uh, just kind of disappeared under the current administration. Uh, speaking of which, we know that Donald Trump has really kind of reformed the Republican Party in certain ways, and uh, we're still in the midst of trying to figure out what's going to happen, how it may shift the Republican Party, and in what ways it might shift it. We do know that because of our partisan politics, we do see that partisanism, where someone is even more loyal or more driven by a particular side, has increased significantly over just the uh, past decade. And we've also seen an increase in people who claim to be independents, which may also be a factor of being a little bit dissatisfied and disillusioned with polarized politics that aren't really solving a lot of problems. These are some things that we'll get into in more detail later on. Now I'm going to put a, uh, an article on Moodle that talks about how our brains we may be hardwired to, a, to some extent as to how we could be have a tendency to lean one way or another politically. Uh, I'll give you a, a chance to respond on that, but uh, it's basically a compilation, 20 different excerpts of peer-reviewed academic journals, which are going to be important for the course, and we'll have an opportunity to discuss some of those. Now, genes can't fully rule our behavior. Humans undergo the longest childhood of all the animal species on the earth, primarily so our brains can develop. We've got an enormous amount of learning that we need to do, and our childhood extends all the way into the mid-20s, so our brains aren't really fully baked in. Adolescence has been redefined till the, till the mid-20s. So we need a lot of protection as children growing up, so our parents and society are providing this protection for us as children as we grow into adults when our brains become fully baked in. So this, all of this process is what really makes us different from all the other animal species is because we have conscious brains that can think and try to solve problems and certainly that decreases the reliance's reliance on genes. Genes therefore combined with our experience. Liberals, the gene plus the interaction with Childhood friends might make you more receptive to change in individual unconventional ideas. We also see that the parents provide a lot of input on framing our political attitudes, but the genetic influence could also start to show after leaving the nest. Now, last thing I want to point out before we finish this uh, particular chapter is that what I'm going to be asking you to do is to think critically. Think right? Think analytically, think objectively. Some, this is sometimes called sociological imagination, where what you want to do is try to, in the course of this, this class, develop the ability to step back and look at your own world, whether it's your own society, your own group, your own country. Step back from the world and look at it from the perspective of an outsider. Those earthlings, what a curious bunch they are, because that will serve you well, particularly for any of the writing assignments. You want to be analytical. You want to be a critical observer. You do not want to spout your opinions and take a side and tell me what you think is right or wrong and use that as a forum to tell me what's wrong with the world. That is not the point. That's not the point of the class. The class is to try to get us to understand a little bit better about how government works, where it came from, why it works, how it works, how it doesn't work, the whys, the what fors, the how comes.